Well, we turn now to a controversial new gun law in the state of Indiana. Police there up in arms over a law that allows citizens to shoot them. It's the first law of its kind in the U.S., and it allows people to pull the trigger if a cop unlawfully enters their home. Of course, police are not happy about this law, which is backed by the National Rifle Association. But with a slew of a recent slew of reports on police brutality, is this power to the people, or can this lead to a dangerous battle between public servants and civilians? To talk more about this, we're joined now by Mark Walters. He's a host of the Armed African Radio and co-author of Lessons from Armed America. Welcome to the show there. Um, so allowing people to shoot police, giving them this power, does, does this empower citizens? Hi, Liz. How are you? First, thanks for having me back. It's great to be here. Uh, that's actually not what this does. Uh, this is actually an amendment to what's known as the Castle Doctrine Law uh, that went into effect in Indiana in 2006. And I think the first thing to do is to start off probably with the, the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I've got a lot of notes in front of me. This is a fairly complicated issue. But let's start with the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which uh, clearly states that the right of the people to be secure in their per, uh, persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. This case originally uh, came up, a gentleman by the name of Richard Barnes who had resisted officers, what he felt were illegally entering his apartment during what was called in by his wife at the time, a 911 call domestic dispute. He resisted the entry by officers into the apartment. He was charged with three misdemeanors, was subsequently convicted. At issue was during that case, his trial judge did not allow the jury to be told that he had the right under common law and Indiana law at that time to reasonably resist what he felt was an illegal or unlawful entry by the police. As a result, the judge did not allow that. The jury did not hear it. He was convicted. An appellate court overturned the conviction, and then it went to the Indiana Supreme Court, if you're following me on this. And the Indiana Supreme Court overturned the appellate, overturning his conviction, letting his convictions stand. And that's how we got where we are today. Okay, and um, that is that, that is the precedent, but this is just one one incidence of, of police, I guess, misconduct. And we are seeing more reports of police misconduct in the country. I think we have some statistics here. Um, they are, I think these are the most recent. It's back from 2010. There were almost 5,000 incidents reported. Almost $350 million was spent in court battling the issue. And, you know, um, and if we go to the next, our next shot there, most of the reported incidences are of police using excessive force so does this serve as a justification for citizens being able to pre protect themselves against police? You know, you have the right, you have an inherent right as a human being to defend your life. What this does, if we go, so this originally came out as SB1 or SE1, number one, uh, which was signed by Governor Mitch Daniels. And what this exactly states is that a person is justified in using reasonable force against a public servant if the person reasonably believes the force is necessary to protect the person or a third person from what the person reasonably believes to be the imminent use of unlawful force by a public servant, prevent or terminate the public servant's unlawful entry or of attack on the person's dwelling or occupied motor vehicle, or prevent or terminate the public servant's unlawful trespass on or criminal interference with property lawfully in the person's possession. Now, what this does not allow, and it's clearly written into the law, and I want people to be very clear on this, that notwithstanding, and I'm quoting again from the law itself, subsection I, a person is not justified in using force against a public servant if the person is A, committing or is escaping after the commission of a crime, two, the person provokes an action by the public servant with intent to cause bodily injury to the public servant, or that the person has entered into combat with the public servant, and so forth, or threatens to continue unlawful action. In other words, you cannot, during the commission of a crime, shoot a police officer. None of, none of the laws have changed in the state of Indiana. What happened is that the Supreme Court, according to Indiana's legislature and the governor, overstepped itself by removing the common law that had stood for years that says a person has the right to lawfully resist unlawful entry into their home, which was not even a part of the original case. So they took legislative action to correct that. 
And you know, Mark, as with many laws, um, critics of this say that this can create this this slippery slope um, and, and raise questions on when it's in fact legal to shoot a police officer. That it can in fact uh, provide justification for shooting a police officer. Um, and the line there between what is allowed, what's legal, and what's not legal uh, can be can get pretty blurry. Yeah, no question. Uh, you know, law enforcement officers around the country, if you're reading some of the, the forums and, uh, you know, are standing up in arms, I believe that many of those law enforcement officers are misinformed as to the law. Hopefully, they're not getting their information from the San Francisco Chronicle or the Cleveland Plain Dealer. But the National Rifle Association has uh, come up with a number of countenances, if you will, uh, to the myths that that the that, that SB1 allows homeowners to shoot and kill police officers they believe are unlawful on their property or in their houses for example that's patently false it allows reasonable force to be justified when a person reasonably believes it is a, it is an unlawful entry by force and to be reasonable the defensive force must be proportional proportional to the reasonably perceived threat now you know, a police officer doesn't have anything to worry about if they're not illegal, if they're not doing anything illegal. What they're concerned with and rightfully concerned with is the perception by the public that they can get, that the public can get away with something that they couldn't have gotten away with prior to, and they can't. Nonetheless, this is stirring a lot of controversy and a lot of fears among the police over there in Indiana as to whether or not this will hinder them from being able to do their job well. And I do want to bring up a quote from a police officer. This was the, from the San Francisco gate. Uh, he says, quote, if I pull over a car and I walk up to it, and the guy shoots me, he's going to say, well, he was trying to illegally enter my property. Um, somebody is going to get away with killing a cop because of this law. Uh, and what do you think about that fear, that um, police feel like their lives are in jeopardy now because um, shooting a police can now be justified? I, I don't believe that it can be justified, and I think that's an unfounded fear. I'm not a police officer, and I'm not the one approaching that vehicle, so it's very difficult for me to, to speak to what's in that police officer's mind. However, it's illegal to shoot a police officer who approaches your vehicle on a traffic stop. You're not going to be able to come up with that excuse. I think that's an unfounded fear. Uh, you know, if you look at the way that these, this law is written, it's very clear when you look at SB1 and actually read it when it, uh, justifiable force is allowed and when it's not allowed. But it does not give anybody the individual uh, the right to shoot at a police officer. But do you think this could put, because, you know, police are supposed to be public servants. Is this pinning the public against the police? You know, I don't think so. I think it's a matter of how this is reported and how it's going to be perceived. Uh, you know, police understandably have every right to be concerned about the perception of the public and the way that this law is being perceived by the public as, as a means of how it's being reported by, quite frankly, irresponsible outlets. Uh, I read the San Francisco Chronicle reports. I've read the Cleveland reports and reports from across the country. And their quote, it's a lot of fear mongering, quite frankly. None of them are going to the facts. If you, if you were to head over to the NRA.ILA or NRA ILA page, for example, you can get the, the facts on the, the myths. Uh, one of the myths is if a police officer is walking by a home and a woman screams because her husband is beating her, that the husband can shoot and kill the officer for entering the home and get away with it. That's patently false. The individual is in, is, uh, is in fact committing a crime, which is what is directly uh, written into the law is illegal. There's been no change actually to Indiana law as it stood prior to the original case that caused all of this problem. They simply rewrote it back into the law. All right. And I guess ultimately, uh, if police, if they aren't serving the public's interests, uh, why should they be treated different, differently from anyone else in terms of somebody feeling like, feeling like they need to protect themselves against another person if they feel like their life is in danger? Uh, you're, are you referring specifically to a police officer? Yes, yes. I mean, in a situation like that where a police officer is breaking the law, uh, I guess then it does make sense that that you know, the, there is no differentiation between a police officer and a civilian uh, if, in both cases, that they are breaking the law and you feel like your life is in danger. Well, I, I, nobody supports law enforcement more than I do on Armed American Radio. I'm, I'm a, an avid supporter of law enforcement across the board. 
but there are also cases, there are, as I said the last time I was on your show, there are bad police officers, there are bad judges, there are bad lawyers. There's someone from every walk of life sitting in a jail cell somewhere in the United States of America today for committing a crime. Simply because someone puts on a uniform or puts on a badge does not make them an inherently good person. That person can't commit a crime, and you showed statistics as well. Uh, if I'm sitting at home at 3 o'clock in the morning and my door gets kicked in, I have a right to defend my life and my family by firing my weapon to stop that. If that were to happen to be police officers on the other side of that door, am I right in doing that? If they were at the wrong home, I may be right in doing that, but I might be right in doing that posthumously as the threat of return force on me will be greater than what I acted upon. So yeah, it's a, it's a thin line. There's no question about it. I understand law enforcement's concern. And it's really sad that we got to this point from the uh, Indiana Supreme Court who overstepped their bounds. Quite and I frankly. do want to ask you one more question, Mark. We don't have that much time left, um, but the National Rifle Association lobbied for this law. This is the same organization that lobbied for uh, Stand Your Ground, which is um, both of them are an expansion of the Castle Doctrine. Um, and Stand Your Ground is getting a lot of controversy right now over what happened in Florida. So um, uh, keeping it in mind that this is the NRA is one of the groups behind this law, could it be about expanding gun rights? I don't think it's about expanding gun rights. Uh, nobody supports law enforcement more than the National Rifle Association. Millions of their members, or hundreds of thousands of their members, are law enforcement agents uh, across the nation in local, county, sheriffs, federal agents, and so forth. They're all member. A lot of them, a large majority of them, are members of the National Rifle Association. What the NRA was doing here and looking at some of the research I've done is simply go back to put into place into the Castle Doctrine, which apparently was gutted by the Indiana Supreme Court overstepping its bounds. They went ahead and replaced it with the language to give that authority back to the citizens to be able to defend themselves against what we know in common law for hundreds of years as an illegal entry. Not an arrest and the right to resist the arrest because they'll be charged, but the right to resist an illegal entry. Okay, and um, you know, Mark, this is the first law of its kind in the U.S. that allows for this, for, for um, citizens in some instances to be able to shoot police if they feel like they're in danger. Do you think this is going to set a precedent, and do you expect other states to pass similar laws? Well, I, I, I would disagree with the way that question was phrased, only along the lines that we don't have a right to shoot police officers. Uh, if you shoot a police officer, you're going to do an awful lot of time if you survive. It's that simple. What this does was give the person the right to resist an unlawful entry into their home and expand it on the Castle Doctrine. Now, many states across, the, across America already have, into, or have under common law uh, the right that this law put back into place that the Indiana Supreme Court removed and many believe overstepped their bounds. Okay, and really quickly, at the end of the day, Mark, do, Mark, do you think that this makes us safer? I do, yes, I do. Uh, but I also see the perspective from law enforcement. It's a little bit too soon to see what's going to happen here. Uh, hopefully everybody gets their wits about them and law enforcement stays safe. That's the ultimate goal, is to keep officers safe. All right, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. That was Mark Walters, host of um, Armed American Radio and co-author of Lessons from Armed America.